and uh, welcome to That Atheist Show, episode number 34. So Matt's going to be with me today, and he likes to talk about politics. So I think we'll look at uh, the question of belief and how it impacts our choice of leaders. Um, so he's going to wander in and put on a microphone, and um, then he'll join in the conversation. But I did finish uh, reading that uh, book by uh, Victor Stenger uh, called Timeless Reality, which kind of uh, actually opened up, gets, there were some new ideas in that one. I mean, one of the things that we have uh, people talking about is quantum mechanics and how there's this sort of weirdness, and therefore um, we have, uh, so hit your, hit your on button, and you're on, okay, we're good. <coughs> and... Um, so we have this uh, quantum weirdness, and there's uh, several interpretations, as to, or uh, yeah, interpretations, ideas about why that is. Uh, one of them is called the Copenhagen um, uh, interpretation. Can I assume we're headed down the path of getting to Deepak Chopra woo woo? You got it. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, so the whole thing is that uh, since we cannot fully explain a lot of this weirdness. Uh, one of, you know, there's the Copenhagen thing, I'll talk about that in a second. Then there's the hidden variables thing, which a lot of scientists say, well, we just don't understand it all, and there's probably some underlying physics that sure. will eventually show up, and we will, you know, and it all makes sense then. Um, then there's this multiple worlds thing, where every time, um, every time a, you know, these part of, you know, the a decision, the, the um, you know, you've got all these particles, and they, they have this, what they call a wave function. And so the wave function um, can go, you know, it, it, it take Schrodinger's cat, yeah. for example. It actively defines itself and its own reality every time a decision is made, which is exactly an interesting thought experiment, but not wholly applicable to it. And, and so the interpretation is that every time a decision has to be made by a particle as to go wh whether you go through this slit or this slit. Which is or such a weird way to describe it. A decision needs to be made by the particle. Exactly. But that we get a, a different universe branches off at every sure. moment. But the, another, the thing that came up in the book, and I've come across a number of these ideas before, is that particles may be traveling backwards in time. And if you, if you remove the time the, the single arrow of time in the quantum world, then all of this weirdness goes away. It all just makes sense. Okay. So it's uh, because I had, I had come across the concept of, say, a positron, which is uh, an anti-electron, uh, being an electron moving backwards in time. That's hmm. fairly well accepted as, a, as an idea. Um, but other particles, you know, anti-electron or uh, anti-protons or anti-neutrons would be uh, you know, the equivalent of a neutron moving backward in time or a proton sure. moving backward in time. And so one, when you do that, all the quantum weirdness goes away, and so all this stuff that Deepak Chakra spent his time talking about yeah. is nonsense. Or the fam famous Sam Harris, I believe it was, who said, L listen, if your answer has anything to do with particle wave or, or quantum theory, then we're not talking about religion anymore. And yeah. we're talking about a vague, woo-woo-y spiritual idea. Yeah. And so the, the thing, you know, that's, that he's looking at, or, or what was the main thrust of the book, is that, for example, when Einstein came along, you know, and came up with relativity, he was trying to say, okay, how can Galileo and Maxwell both be right at the same time? If you buy all the premises that are in the two systems, then you get an inconsistent product. You know, it's doing this. Yeah. Okay. Well, if what you do is you say, okay, um, if we say the speed of light is constant and not all clocks tick together, then they just mesh very nicely. So you've dropped the premise, which is that all clocks tick at the same rate. Yeah. And so what what Stanger is advocating is to say, guys, it's time to give up this thing about a single direction for time. That on the quantum level, time is probably going in both directions. And if we, if we drop that requirement that time has to continue, you know, in a, a single arrow at the quantum level, then 
you know, the weirdness goes away. Hmm. And which I found to be very, very interesting, and it just it just made me want to, you know, look into the subject a whole lot more. Yeah, and I'd never I'd never looked into that subject. Yeah. I've never heard of that particularity before. I only so. know the base sheen of anything when it comes to quantum yeah. physics. So. But the but the issue that we have, okay, is let's 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 look at politics, okay, and the question of belief in politics. Okay. You know, the thing that's that's been sort of bothering me, I, I, it always bothered me, but the last couple of months it's really gotten to me, is this line that it's true for me. Yeah. And it's my truth. It's my truth, yes. And that's Which is a meaningless turn of phrase. And that's supposed to stop the conversation. And, you know, I threw out the it's true for me card and, you know, well, that's you've been because, trumped. That's because we've come to a society now where it's more about respecting people than it is about actually having these kind of conversations. You, yeah. If you don't respect this person's beliefs, then you're being offensive, and they don't, they're not required to have a conversation with you. Yeah. They're not required to change their ideas or even talk to you about these, these different ideas they have because you're not willing to respect their beliefs first and foremost. Yeah. Exactly. I don't respect their beliefs. No, no, we've moved pre-enlightenment again, and I don't know how it happened. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's... <coughs> it's that was one of the things that came up in the book was he was sort of talking about these these people who've introduced these kinds of ideas um, and they're sort of growing in popularity. Yes, they are. And it's it's really Even frightening. Even some people I would have considered my allies that's growing in popularity. And it's gotten to be, you know, it's really hard, it's really easy to offend someone, you know. I mean, they're just like waiting to be offended at yeah. which point they can, you know, they're looking to take offense. They've realized that in today's society, offense holds power. Yeah. And as soon as you give that out, you obviously give people reign to find things offensive for the sake of power. Why would you do that? Yeah. I don't understand how it's come to that, but it's and it and did it's root in religion. It, it. I mean, our freedom of speech laws exist because we were not allowed to criticize religion, because we weren't allowed to criticize yeah. the state. Now, yeah. if I do either one of those, it's considered offensive or disrespectful. It's kind of getting weird. It's getting like new dark agey, and, and I'm not big on that. I mean, we have all this nice equipment here that's going to be confiscated sooner or later, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> With the way things are going and the free speech laws being, I mean, I, I'm being attacked publicly as a free speech advocate. I don't even know how to react to that. Yeah. Really. Uh, what's the response to that from a thinking American citizen? Okay, and? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have to agree with what you said. No. But I will... I will defend your right to say it. And I believe that bad ideas are allergic to light. Yeah. I believe when you take a bad idea and you drag it into the light, that, that bad idea gets exposed to more people who go, hey, that's a bad idea as it goes by. Yeah. Putting these things as being, hey, you're not allowed to talk about them publicly, that's how you get little mini rebellions, that's how you get like little pockets of resistance and crazy people. Yeah. When you push these people underground, they're capable of forming underground movements. What, what are we doing? And, and what are we doing in the Middle East? You know, we are marginalizing people. We are bombing them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've got, um, you know, what is it? France has now got 10%, uh, you know, Islamic immigrants. Yeah. You know, and, but they can't find any jobs because nobody's going to hire them. There's huge xenophobia going yeah. on there. And what do they expect? I mean, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the people who died in Paris deserve to die. Yeah. Okay? They're all good people. It's just that we have created a, a situation in which closed thinking in bubbles occurs, and these people are angry. Yeah. And you know, you keep you keep you keep poking at them, they eventually are going to come back swinging. And yeah, you know. well, it's it is an interesting geopolitical situation that's going on over there because we have been back and forth in that region since the middle 70s. Yeah. I mean, it's been back and forth. I mean, it really did start with people calling us for help, which was the most unfortunate way it could have started because yeah. that gave us the moral high ground to do terrible things. Because mm -hmm. we were told, come in here and help us. Yeah. And then from that point on, we have been playing the little Dutch boy yeah. or stomping on fires in a forest trying to not let this spread, re not realizing that it's actually kind of part of the problem. Yeah. But it's interesting to note, I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, it started with the Soviets invading Afghanistan. Well, the reality was that there was a government in, uh, you know, Afghanistan yeah. that invited the Soviets in. Yes. Why? Because they were having problems with, with a lot of the tribes, and they were 
looking for an ally to come in. Yeah, well, because realistically, Soviet communism and Islamism, if you just add Islam to Soviet communism, they really mesh quite well. Yeah. It's about one collectivism. It's about uh, uh, it's it's all about the same kind of things. I mean, believe it or not, a lot of the Islamist people are heavy into uh, taking care of the poor. Yeah. I mean, I've even, I'll give them that. I fuck, I argue with them all the time, but I'll still give them the fact that they are required by their religion to give a significant portion of their funds to the poor. Mm -hmm. So communism appealed to these people yeah. as long as they were told by the people who they were going to be taking over, you can keep your religion. Yeah. They were like, yeah, sure, we'll work with you. The West clearly doesn't want to work with us. I mean, there there was something to that, but it's the same as uh, so now we've got those tribesmen, that, tribesmen that called us for help, yeah. and we thought we were doing the right thing in the 70s, and ever since then we've kind of been stuck. Yeah, we it's been like the the tar baby thing. Yeah, I re I remember going to a lecture. Um, this would be in the late 70s. That it was was it, you know, it was announced publicly, and so I went. But it was at Harvard in one of the big lecture halls. And there was this guy named uh, Fred, Hall Fred Halliday, who had been an observer for Spiri. They had put him in Afghanistan like 10 years earlier, because they said, this is all come in the past. Yeah. And, and we want people in there talking about, you know, writing about this and, um, you know, chronicling what is going on. And he, had, he gave a lecture in which he said, uh, among many other things, but one of the things that really sort of stuck with me was that at the time, the average annual income of an Afghanistani was $137 a year. So that's, you know, less than a dollar a day. Yeah. But the Chinese were um, offering $1,500 for every Soviet machine gun that you turned in. So if you killed a Soviet soldier, okay, you could have, you know, like 12 years worth of annual... Well, that's that's an interesting technique. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, think about it. Where, how else can you kill a Soviet soldier for $1,500? Yeah. Okay? I mean, it's cheap. And, you know, that was, the, that was during the time when the Soviets and China were... No, one of the Soviets left. I mean, you've done it. That's some baseline motivation. That's motivating, that's motivating every single civilian in a region to sneak attack your soldiers. I mean, you have to get out. That's a mire. You got it. Yeah, that's and a mire. That's an absolute geopolitical nightmare. There's no winning that. That's like what we're dealing with right now in um, uh, um, uh, okay, Israel. Yeah. And between th those two, it's, it's really hard. You got to understand for Israel to even continue to exist, and it's really hard but for Hamas. Let's, let's get to let's get back to Israel. But what you've got is you've got all the hardliners in the Soviet Union, just like we have the hardliners, you know, standing in the Republican platforms, exactly. okay, today, talking about we've got to bomb them some more. Well, we've got people in this country that worship Putin. Yeah. No, thank you. I thought yeah. we did this fascism thing already in the West. Yes. I thought we learned our lesson. Yeah. But, no, apparently yeah. not. So the hardliners won out. The Soviets moved in, at which point we then had a justification to go in and fight them. Yeah. Which, it's like... Yeah, but we had been involved in, you know, that's the late 70s. Yeah. You know, that's Cyrus Vance. I remember yeah. Cyrus Vance, you know, standing there, you know, in the Khyber Pass with his rifle, you know, doing, um, you know, photo op. And unfortunately, we're also a little bit deluded in thinking yeah. you can force these people into democracies. Yeah. That's another issue. And, and one of the pictures that, that Fred Halliday had with him was a picture of Cyrus Vance doing a lecture, okay, with a, a line drawing map of the Middle East that was upside down. Okay, so he's there pointing to this stuff, and there's a, he's got a photograph of Cyrus Vance pointing to this map that's upside down. <laughs> At least you know? he knew the region well. Exactly. You know, it was just it, w it was just pure nonsense. And but we had been involved in you know in the Middle East before um, in Iran in uh, 1953 with Mossadegh. Um, and even earlier than that. So we're mucking in their country. Oh, yeah. Okay. We oh, are. Yeah, they didn't do well after even World War I. That whole region fell apart. The fall of the Ottoman Empire was the yeah. beginning of all this. Yep. Going far enough back in history, the crushing of the Ottoman Empire is why we're standing here today. Yeah, and then, and then we moved even further back to the Crusades and all, yeah. all the, you know, they hate us for that. You know, and now. We've got this situation where there are, you know, these marginalized people who have been bombed. You know, there's been a grandmother, grandfather, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, somebody is dead. Yeah. Okay? And these people aren't happy. And we, as a, as a society, 
you know, are listening to this nonsense from our Republican candidates talking about how we got to go hit them some more. If they don't understand, we'll hit them harder. And if they don't understand, we'll hit them even harder. If they don't understand, we're going to pound them even more. I mean, it complete lack of imagination. Yeah. Cannot, they, you know, an inability to take things from the perspective of the other person, to be able to mentally trade places and empathize with what's going on in their life. And, you know, these people can, you know, hold themselves out as the pinnacle of success and the model by which we should, you know, measure ourselves. And that's sick. Yeah. Yeah, so. they're not they're not that. There there are many things, but they're not that. You can be successful quite easily without having to be a good person. <laughs> yeah. It's and, not and, hard. and it probably helps you in that process in, in this society. Yeah, almost assuredly. But is, let's, get back, let's get back to Israel. I, I sort of cut you off a little bit there because I really wanted to, to make yeah, the, the yeah, point no, about that. But let's, let's move back to Israel. Yeah, it's just uh, it, it's the understanding that, that there's no, there is no right anymore yeah. in a lot of these situations. We've reached an impasse in this whole region where there's no right move to make. It, it were when when we intervene, we're attacked as being crusader-like interventionalists. Mm -hmm. When we don't intervene, we're told we should have, and it's our fault for not getting there earlier. Yep. We in the West have reached a point where we can't win. Well, we reached that a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, but, we've but reached now at a point now where we simply can't win. I think what's happened is it's gotten so extreme that people are beginning to say, "Excuse me, we can't win." Yeah. Whereas before. This, the whole concept of American exceptionalism would not us allow us to even entertain yeah. the possibility yeah, like a, 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 that we couldn't dominate. Exactly, and that we couldn't, like I said, it's this concept that we are going to be nation builders in this region is this just completely delusional. These yeah. people have no interest in following our way of life whatsoever, and we kind of have to accept that. Yeah. You can't enforce our way of life on these people, which is fine. I mean, they have a right to, the things that they desire, they have a right to. Yeah. They have a complete right to, to, to their way of life. Mm -hmm. um, that's it's not even negotiable. That's, yeah. the, that's the same issue I have when people start talking about Israel and Palestine. It's like, look, look, I understand that what happened in the late 40s with Israel and the insolution they're in was perhaps a bit of a mistake. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. Because a, each side is essentially advocating for a genocide of the other. Mm -hmm. Each yep. side. Neither yeah. one of you is right. We need to come to a middle ground solution, or there will be very bad, bad things occurring in these regions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was there was an interesting. Um, we've had Jack Dresser on the show early on, and we yes, probably should yeah. have we probably should have him back on. But uh, he and Mariah uh, really are the advocates in this area for Palestine, saying, "Look, there's you know, there was this thing called the." Al Nakba, the catastrophe that happened when Israel came in and began uh, killing people and decimating, vill burning villages and chasing the people off the land and just basically taking over. Now, there was a guy, um, Dan Snyder, who wrote a, uh, I guess Jack Dresser had written an uh, editorial that I'd never read, but um, Dan Snyder had responded to him and basically called him a liar. and talked about how um, the Palestinians had their chance in 1947, that they could give up half of their land and everything would have been just peachy. Now, if you were to ask Americans, okay, here's a referenda, yeah. okay, you can give up half of your land to the Mexicans or to the blacks or to the Native Americans, and then you can have peace. What do you think that the vote would go in America? It probably wouldn't go well. No, it, it certainly would be, you know, 90 plus percent, forget it, Yeah. which is exactly what happened in Palestine, which of course, you know, the Zionists have used as a justification. Well, they had their chance. Yeah. We gave them their chance and they didn't take it. And now we're just teaching them a lesson for the fact that they didn't take it. Yeah. Well, uh, and there's a, uh, and frankly speaking, when it comes to this incident, like I've said to several people on the subject, there's a level of a lack of pragmatism that the Palestinians have that is just insanity. Yeah. It's utter insanity. The lack of pragmatism on that side is insane. Uh -huh. What the heck do you think you're going to accomplish? You, at this point, are literally bringing a knife to a gunfight yeah. and then being surprised at the results of this. Yeah. This is not how a community comes together to rise back to power. Uh -huh. This is not how one stops a conflict. 
Yeah. And you know you don't have the numbers or the technology to fight the Israelis. Why are you doing it this way? Yeah. Why not do it on a global scale? Why not do it in a manner that is peaceful so that you actually keep the upper hand yeah. morally and on a global scale? That's how India won its freedom from the British. Mm -hmm was by not being ultra-violent and fighting them, but showing what the British were willing to do. Yeah. And then the British people themselves went, mm, we, we kind of feel bad about this. We don't want to do this yeah. anymore. I mean, that was one of the big things with Gandhi, is whenever an action was going to occur, he made sure that the press was there to record it. Yes. And if the press was not going to be there, the action was canceled. And because he was, you know... He was very aware of PR. Exactly. And... You know, I mean, one of the things that, that's, that's talked about, for example, within the atheist community is that when these discussions go on or a debate, the debate is not between, you don't want to waste your time having a debate no. if nobody's around to do it. If, if there's going to be a debate, you need to have an audience because what's going to happen is um, the person who is supporting the side of religion, okay, their stuff falls, falls apart. Yes, on public scrutiny. You sitting there, you're not going to change the other person's minds, and if you go into the debate trying to do that, you're going to waste a lot of time. Yeah. The goal is to draw that person's ideas out, publicly show them to the world, and go, that's what he thinks. He's nuts. Yeah, that's what he thinks. Yep. That's, that's the whole goal, and it should never be anything else. When you're actually trying to be like, oh, and but in this verse and that, it says this, so why do you still don't bother with the you? Yeah. You're, you're totally wasting your time bothering to engage one-on-one -on -one with these people. Yeah. Because they haven't read it anyway. No. No, and if they have, then they're so full of double-think that it's impossible for them to have a true thought when it comes to their, their beliefs because they have exercised all the bits they don't want to know yeah. and kept all the bits they particularly care for. You know, it, it's like in this book, uh, Stenger's book, I mean, he, he, you know, periodically throughout the scientific discussion, there's, you know, somebody like William Lane Craig will, will yeah. pop up who, I mean, we have this Kalam cosmological argument. I mean, the fact that it's got, you know, this Kalam name, I mean, it makes it really official. But it basically says that, you know, uh, any, anything um, that has a beginning is caused, the universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause, ergo God. Um, <sighs> you know, which is... It's like the Islamic apologist I talked to. You come to a shore and there is a boat. <laughs> Do you think that boat was created just by randomness? Like, what? What are yeah. we doing? How did this discussion get here? Yeah, but you know, it's just the the problem is that, that if you buy the premises, you buy the conclusion. Yeah. Because you know, Craig's first premise is flawed. Yeah. Okay. His second premise is flawed, and you know, it what what you need to do is to realize, for example, that if you say, well, you know, our our universe had a beginning, and okay, well, let's assume it did. We've got a sample of one. Okay, how many how many other universes have you considered? Yeah, you know, and so and how does one go about sampling those if that were necessary? Exactly, and it's a, it's it's interesting because like you, you you make that statement about how like you draw conclusions from the statements and then mm -hmm. follow them to those logical conclusions. Uh, I think it's interesting that logic and critical thinking and analysis are no longer necessary and forcibly taught subjects in school. Mm -hmm. Because I, I was I was probably one of the last students in my entire like schooling that uh, after we graduated from that program it was canceled. Yeah. That was the end of that program. Yeah. And the teacher used to jokingly refer to it as the anti-propaganda program. Right. It was that was the whole point was for you to sit down in the classroom and she would present you with things and be like, tell me if that statement is true, yeah. and if so why. And it would be actual documents from the day, like whatever was going on. She'd show you news clips and be like, what what mm -hmm. percentage of that was utter BS. Yeah. And, and critical thinking has been systematically removed from the curriculum. Why? Because they can't Christi afford it. Christianity doesn't doesn't um, marketing doesn't like it either, and and corporate marketing doesn't. Marketing like it. doesn't like it. God don't like it. Can't have That's it. That's right. And, and, and to be fair, corporate marketing is pretty much our god. So it is. The uh, so the thing is that we are not allowed to question. Uh, we are not allowed. To say, excuse me, where's your evidence for that uh, for that statement? Yeah, and and the thing is that people become very offended when you when you ask that because and circling there's back around to our beginning exactly, which is the entitlement to my I have yeah. a right to feel good about what I want to believe. It's all about my yeah. feels. Yeah.
I feel bad. You made me feel bad about thinking that at some point in my life. It's like I can imagine if I were a hardcore Christian or a hardcore religious person and one day yeah. it crept into my head that all this was wrong. I probably would have felt bad. I know that as I've changed my thinking, as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. I have regretted some of the older beliefs I held. Right. It's, that, it's the same thing. It's just you added God. I never had to deal with that portion of the program. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's really what it is. It's, it's people, when people say they're offended, 95% of the time they may as well just be saying, I feel like I've been proven intellectually wrong, and that makes me feel stupid. Yep. And as a defense, I hate you. Yes. I mean, you're, you're an elitist. You, oh. you know, you're arrogant. You're this. You're that. Oh. And all you're doing is saying, "Excuse me, I see no evidence for that statement that you've made." You know, whether it's belief in fairies or, yeah. um, you know, or Deepak Chakra's, um, you know, frequency woo. Yeah, uh, I, I, I love being called an elitist. I really do. Yeah. I, I, I revel in it, considering my socioeconomic background. It just <laughs> brings me all the laughs. That's all it does to me. Like, yes, I am deeply, deeply elitist. You're totally yeah. right. My flannel shirt says it all. I'm definitely an elitist. But, so, you know, the, the question is, how, how much longer do we continue this? <laughs> okay. And what's the alternative, and how do we make this stop? That's really my begging question. How long yeah. do we continue this? Preferably not one more day. Yeah. How do I make it stop or slow down is really where I'm at in my yeah. life. You know, and, and unfortunately... You always come back to the whole thing that a lot of people aren't going to change until they die. Yeah. So these these kinds of ideas, um, and what what's occurred is is that we've given per permission for people to not look at their ideas. Um, I you know I, I look at different things. I I started seeing it in say children's cartoons, probably in the late 70s where really what you had was attitude. Yeah. You know, we're selling attitude. We're, we're the powder puff girls. We're, you know, Dexter's Lab. We're, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. An exception is SpongeBob. I mean, SpongeBob doesn't have attitude. No, he's basically the king every man, to be fair. I've watched just enough to know that. And his best friend's a moron, and the person with an attitude is disliked. Mm -hmm. Although, personally, I actually like Squidward the best, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's me being a grumpy old man at 28. That's my problem. <laughs> so. I'm already standing on my porch saying, Get off my lawn! And I'm like, oh, God, I'm 28. You need to stop already. It's, you're way too young to be mad at kids. <laughs> <laughs> way too young to be yelling at kids. Yeah. But no, it's, uh, it, it is interesting that and you see that now. It's everywhere. And yeah. it's where our advertising is. They're not selling a product. 95% of the ads out there are for products and what people are going to buy anyway. Yeah. Like, do you see a Coca-Cola ad and think someone just went, ah, Coke, got to try it. Never seen it, never never had it before. It's definitely time for a Coke. They're not hitting anyone new. They're staying yeah. in, the, in the public eye and they're mm -hmm. selling an entire idea. Like, I saw an insurance commercial that was selling the idea that if you'd had insurance, you would visit your parents in another state more often because you'd be more willing to go on road trips and you'd go see grandma and grandpa more frequently. Yeah. The level of madness one must achieve to even write that commercial is amazing. <laughs> I mean, just to put that together and be like, guys, a great ad idea. Put yeah. it out. It'll sell, it'll sell Geico. No problem. Put it out there. What? People just aren't being taught this anymore. Yeah. They're just not. Our educational system is shaking itself apart. Go look at what's happening on college campuses right now. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, a lot of that is, is I mean, it's around the, the race issue. You know, which I, I think has some justification. I mean, we do, did see in, um, there's, I guess, two police officers who are now being tried for murder. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's new territory. That is, you know. Yeah. Uh, and. Well, and if you understand law, the reason they're doing it is because they know the law system well enough to know that if they're charged with manslaughter, it would stick. Yeah. You charge them with first degree murder, it's not going to stick, man. No. That's not going to see. It's not going to get through a jury trial as first degree murder by the state law. And I've already, I've seen it happen before. Mm -hmm. In my state where I came from, I've seen a cop charged with murder, knowing he's going to walk. Yeah. Because you can't stick a cop with a murder charge for firing his fire. It's almost impossible. You'd have to prove he literally went. You know what? I've decided today, on this day, I shall leave my house henceforth and shoot a black man with my service pistol. That is my goal. And you'd have to somehow be able to prove that that was his intention. So that's why they're doing it. It's actually defending him. 
Yeah. They're actually saving him from their own legal system by charging him with a crime he could never have stuck to him. Yeah. It's really quite genius. It's a really manipulative way to say, okay, look, 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 we arrested him, we put him in jail, we charged him with murder. Can you go home now? Are you done yeah. protesting now? Because we arrested him. He's going to jail. We're fine now? Well, he's not going to stick. Yeah. He may have a lesser charge of manslaughter. He may have a lesser charge. But at the very least, you know that murder charge won't stick. No. It just won't. I mean, that's the unfortunate side effect of the legal system being very, very specific about what charges mean. But with it, when it comes to that, it's more the, the colleges, it's more the, the, the concepts of things like safe spaces. Mm -hmm. These are just simply ways to shut down intellectual conversation yep. you don't like. Okay, we have a call, so... Hello, you're on the air. What's your name? John. Hi, John. <laughs> Welcome to the show again. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were talking about uh, insurance a few minutes ago, uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, I, I'd kind of like to point out is that, uh, uh, you know, people tend to believe just about uh, anything uh, that the, the whatever you call them, people that write these silly things. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they have this act. If you've got the uh, accident forgiveness policy, oh, we yeah. won't raise your rate if you have an accident. Yeah. So how that works is, see, if, say you're paying $100 a month now for a standard one, and you can get the, the uh, if you have an accident, they'll raise your, fri your thing to $120 a month. But if you want accident forgiveness, you pay $120 a month, from day one, so that when you have an accident, you've already paid however many years before you have the accident. Oh, yeah. Uh, you paid the rate that you would have paid after an accident. So you're paying for the accident whether you have it or not. And that's just one of the ways that the, uh, the people that write this uh, uh, sales pitches and stuff get to you. It's just like in the same, same uh, ilk, uh, you know, we have these special elections for levies, Yeah. Uh -huh. and one recently was the jail levy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to we're going to ask people to vote in a levy of X number of dollars on their taxes, just to run the jails. And we promise we will spend every dime of that on the jails, and uh, we will have an accounting at the end of the year to prove that we've done this, and you'll go be so much better off. But what happens? Yes, let's say that uh, right now they're they're giving uh, two million dollars out of the general budget to run the jails. Yep. So we have the election and we vote that in, and we get three million dollars through the new raise. So the next uh, time the general budget comes up, we don't need to give that three million dollars to the jail this year because we have this levy money. So we'll keep a couple of million of it for general funds to spend any way we want, and yep. people don't realize it. You know, they have to account for the money from the levy, but the money that they were putting in from the general fund, they don't have to account for. So they just give less money from the general fund, and uh, so they get you coming and going. Well, I, I think this, you know, certainly brings up the concept of dishonesty. Um, you know, and that brings us up to the concept of good versus evil. Okay, so in other words, well, let me, let me just, let me add a story. Uh, I went down last week to visit a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in a couple of years um, down south of Los Angeles. And one of the things that was happening was there was this project, well, let's look at the city of Newport Beach. Newport Beach um, is very wealthy. It has a house, median household income over $120,000 a year. And so it's a lot of rich people. Now, California mandates that you have to, have to produce a certain number of units, any new construction of affordable housing, or you have to pay a developer fee. Well, they've collected $4.2 million in developer fees. And so they don't want to build affordable housing, so they have to get rid of the money real fast. So what they did was they put out a, a request for proposals and got some proposals back. And they were able to pick out of the pieces of the proposals three proposals to spend the $4.2 million that produced zero net increase in housing. They were going to refurbish two um, uh, senior centers, uh, retirement centers, and they were going to 
buy this property, kick out the 12 tenants, and then put in 12 new tenants. Now, the, the tenants are already paying under market rates because the property you know, is yeah. not in great shape. So they're, pick, they're kicking out 12 people, and they're going to replace them with 12 new ones. But in order to sell the thing, they said, oh, we'll replace them with veterans. Okay, and what they did at, well, that the, was smart. at the public hearing was to contact these veteran groups, and all these veterans came up about how you wouldn't want to vote this down because it would not be supporting our veterans. And when in reality, the 190-page agreement that's being signed for this thing doesn't include that. So in other words, after the fact, they still won't have to put any veterans in. Because it's not actually in the... Because it's not in the agreement. You know, I mean, we're talking about dishonesty, you know, layered on dishonesty, layered on dishonesty. Does that constitute evil? Well, it's certainly getting as close to it as you can get. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, uh, earlier uh, uh, talking about the Middle East and yeah. stuff like that, and I believe I said this once before on a program, this, you know, you can't go in and beat somebody down and then tell them, well, you've got to live like this from now on yeah. when they've lived their way of life for thousands of years. And uh, it's just like, uh, you know, in the deep south with the uh, segregation and stuff like that, you can't change people's thinking because if the father teaches the kids, you know, you got to hate these people because I hate them, yep. uh, a certain number of those kids, after, you know, like after they passed the uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, a certain number of these kids will go to co now integrated colleges and meet uh, people of other races and find out they're really decent people. So they reject their parents' teaching and they teach their kid to accept that. But some of the kids that the, this family raises will keep dad's concept that you got to hate these people. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, it, it's getting back to our own couple of programs go evolution. It's an evolution that... Uh, takes many generations to wipe out that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can't just go in there and, and bomb the hell out of somebody and tell them you got to change your way of living. and uh, It just don't work that way. Yep. Ag agreed. But that, that gets you into this other question about, well, you know, what is it that people are doing? I mean... At the same time, um, you know, we've got people beheading, you know, there, there's beheadings going on, and that was going on at the official level, at the state level in the Middle East, long before groups like yeah, ISIS. Yeah, that goes on today yeah. in Saudi Arabia. That happened on Thanksgiving. They executed 50 people publicly by beheading. Yep. This is not just because ISIS happens to be barbarians with no money. Right. The Saudi Arabians are very wealthy peoples, and they chop their criminals' heads and hands off, too. Yeah. And, and I remember when I was, I mean, my sort of first introduction to real life in the Middle East, uh, when I was in high school, I had a, a history teacher who taught American history, uh, Freddie Ferris. Really, I, I really liked him as an instructor. A lot of other students didn't, but I thought he was outstanding. And he actually worked for the CIA. He uh, was a personal friend of the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi. And so once or twice a year, Freddie Ferris... I'm sure it's a good position to have in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So he, a couple times a year, Freddie Ferris would disappear, and he would come back with a, you know, beautiful tan. <laughs> and, um, and one time after that, he sort of stopped the class and said, I got I to gotta tell you about this. And so what had happened was some guys on one of our army bases uh, had gotten drunk and stolen a Jeep and crashed it into a mosque. And Freddie's job <laughs> was to go over there and talk the sheik out of killing these guys. And so he, you know, it took, this one took two weeks. And, uh, you know, he was, it, it was an interesting discussion having him, having him talk about that. But that wasn't something that people normally think about, you know, in, in terms of, you know, kind of real life experience and how the world works. Yeah, that's you know, a court martialing offense. You don't yeah. usually behead these people. And, and the thing is that, um, you know, do we want to support that kind of behavior in another country? 
You know, at a certain level, you say, well, you know, they get to live however they want to live. Yeah, I'm not saying I support that. I'm yeah. saying I don't think it's functional for us to bomb them and say, stop it. Exactly. You know, I mean, there are other ways to, you know, in other words, if you show them in a positive manner that there's a better way to live, um, I think that's good. But, you know, on the, on the, by the same token, uh, do you stand by and allow another holocaust? or, you know, genocide of another and nature. And that's where you get to the, you know, Sam Harris levels where you're discussing when it's okay to intervene. And yeah. any time you start discussing that, especially from our side of politics, you're just going to be bashed about the face and neck as someone that wants to go to war. Yeah. Instead of understanding that maybe other people want to go to war and simply our side saying, no war, no war, has never stopped a war ever. Yeah. Ever. Uh -huh. When has the United States said no war, no war? I thought we'd always ready to jump war to war. Oh, pre World War II, we, we desperately were wanted nothing to do with the war in Europe. Just like we desperately don't want to have anything to do with a war right now. Yeah, we have yeah. crazy right wingers that want to go to war, but the American people don't want to go to war. Well, they never have. No, the no. people. I mean, uh, who are we? We're just people. We don't run the country. Well, yeah. I wish we did, but. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, we were talking a while back about uh, Jerusalem and, and Palestine, you know. Uh, we support the, the uh, Jerusalem with everything they need to, to not only defend themselves, but to be aggressive. And uh, most of the generation that's kicking around today don't realize that we took that, the, uh, uh, when the uh, League of Nations took away the, uh, part of that country and give it to the Jews because of the way the Nazis treated the Jews yeah. and just took that country away from people that lived there for centuries and, and give it to them and, and and then they're not satisfied with it. They they set boundaries up. Now they cross over the boundaries to build proper, build houses and stuff for their for the Jewish people on the other side and if some Jewish kid teenager throws rocks at them, they go in and bulldoze their house down. And that, that's not the way you make friends. <laughs> no, it's not. But it, takes, uh, it takes generations. And I think the, the, uh, the Internet is a great thing. I think the Internet over time is going to really change the whole uh, uh, situation as these people over there can get the Internet and see how other people live. Yep. Uh, a lot of people, uh, especially, you know, on uh, the, uh, the commoners like me, uh, aren't uh, aren't even aware of of what's going on in the world. They they're aware of what's going on in their country or their village or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now they can see what's going on in the world, and they're going to want some of that. Yeah. There was but, talk, talking about the internet um, and and the sort of Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. There's a website called RememberTheseChildren.org, and what it does is it has chronicled uh, every killing of an Israeli or Palestinian child since 2000. They're all, their pictures are all up there. There's a story about what happened. They, they just keep a, a log of it. And right now it's going 12.6 Palestinian kids get killed for every Israeli child. And these are all innocents. You know, they're not, they're not the adults. These are children being killed. Yeah. And that's that's a sad that's a sad commentary you know and it's and it's about a you know this is being done in the name of Judaism um, you know and there are people who are supporting it um, in the sense that uh, they either don't look to see what the thing is or they've bought the propaganda that says you know all Arabs are terrorists um, not all Arabs are terrorists yeah and you know, anytime you use a universal quantifier on any group of people, you're guaranteed to be wrong. And that's something that should be taught in a uh, critical thinking class, exactly. of which we don't have any more critical thinking classes because corporate America and the Christian right want them removed from the school systems. So we create, you know, these systems and you can't, you can't, in other words, what we've done is, is we've, we've created a a generation of people or multiple generations of people who are not able to empathize and that's a dangerous place to be in or interested in doing so yeah, yeah. 
uh, most most of our uh, generations, uh, I forget what they call the the twenties to thirty generation. Now they always got these names well, the, for the millennials. The millennials, yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing about the millennials, so many of them are, just aren't even interested in what's going on in the world, and, it's, and a lot of them don't even know what's going on in the United States. And uh, you know, I have a granddaughter, she's 25, and she's never voted. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, they, she don't know who to vote for. She's not interested in that kind of stuff. So, no, and, 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 and she's okay. not. You know, she's not a rarity either. Yeah. No, that, I've tried to explain this to people for like the past two years. The natural state of humanity is not caring about politics. This is an experiment, and you guys are failing it. Yeah. You guys are screwing it up because we're required to be engaged politically. If we're not, you will fall to a dictator. You will fall to a king. That's the natural state of things. Most human beings don't want to vote. Most human beings don't want the responsibility of dealing with the system. Yeah. Oh, we we got a great system. We got the best politicians money can buy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that's our fault. Yeah. We let that happen. We're sitting in this position because of the apathy that our generations yeah. have felt. I mean, I have I have actually listened to um, you know millennials right to my face tell me that you're an old guy and you're responsible for all the problems in the world. Yeah. Okay. And at a certain level, they're correct. But at another level. Um, well, that no. disavows them from any responsibility. That's the point. So, if I'm responsible, you know, then I'm to blame, and you know, they're they don't have to do anything. They don't have to learn. They don't have to consider. Um, they don't have to balance the op, you know, the options. They don't have to uh, trade off between the the goals and values of one group versus another. It, you know, this is it's a complex and messy world. And you know it's being it's being brought down to very simple, uh, you know, kind of black and white stuff. And so again, we're creating a, a world of people who cannot deal with shades of gray. Yeah. Yeah, that is the it is a sad world too. Yeah, it really is. The world in black and white is a very sad place to live. You don't yeah. have any ability for nuance, really. Yeah. And so many people you talk to, they really can't wrap around um, holding multiple competing ideas within their head. You know, it has to be all of this or all of this, but you know, these, these cases where these people are partially right and these people are partially right, you know, that's just something they can't handle. No. Well, uh, that brings up a, uh, a kind of uh, thinking or, or something that I've always been... Uh, uh, like to tell people about, and that is I have two concepts about thinking. And uh, to me, if I'm going to build a cabin or something, I think about what it takes to make it and what it's going to look like, what I have to cut out and everything, and I call that thinking. Mm -hmm. But when I see somebody, you know, pull in front of me, and I say to myself, I'd like to smash the back end of his rig with mine and, and send him sailing off the road, and that's self-talk. And to me, self-talk is not thinking. Yeah. Thinking is pictures. And the trouble is we believe our self-talk when we shouldn't be believing it. And uh, I, I, what got me started on this was years ago I read a book called uh, Bridges, Not Walls. Yeah. And I don't remember who it was by. And I, don't, I was trying to look through my big uh, bookcase here, and I can't find it. But uh, it, uh, he said, you know, if... If somebody wants to drive faster than you and whiz by you, he's got every right to do that as long as he's within the law. And you have no no reason to uh, to be, you know, hateful and vengeful and everything because of it, because what you tell yourself you do. And if you just tell yourself something different, and that's what it takes to, uh, to change your attitude is to change your self-talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, uh, sense? yeah. In cognitive behaviorism, those are referred to as tapes. They're said you need to change your tapes because it's uh, a system by which, uh, when you do something, the first thing when you wake up in the morning, 95% of the time, your first thoughts are going to be the same. 
uh, and when you learn to change those initial thoughts, when you learn to change those, those immediate reactions to situations, your emotional reactions to situations, you can change your perception on, on life. Yeah. I, I don't think that people are responsible for the thoughts that they have. I think they're responsible if they entertain those thoughts. Yeah. Just well, see, that's what, uh, what brings these uh, monsters on, like what happened in, uh, in uh, California today, you yeah, know. They, they tell themselves that they, they hate this certain group of people or no, whatever, I, I, I and they keep telling themselves until they can't stand it anymore, and they've got to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. So it, there yeah. again, if they just change their self-talk, what they're telling themselves, and uh, tell them, well, these people got their right to do what they're doing as long as they're within the law, and uh, it's none of my business. You're a libertarian there of you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, we, we had a, a little uh, excitement uh, around here uh the police had to call, uh, the, the grocery store here had to call the police in because there was some guy going down the aisle and he was pulling the cornflakes and the raisin bran mm-hmm. and the wheaties and stuff like that off and into the floor and just beating at the smithereens with a bat. Okay. And when the police picked him up, they said, that was the worst serial killer they ever seen. <laughs> okay. But that will open up the lines for somebody else. Okay, thanks, thanks John. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. So, <laughs> let's take the Edney going. But yeah, that was actually, there was a, a whole thing that happened today in California. Yeah. Um, guys broke into a room of 40 people and shot 31 of them, so. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, Pam was mentioning that, but I, I spent the day producing out city clubs. So, yeah. there will be more city clubs on um, community television and the internet. Yeah, I spent, I spent the day preparing <laughs> a video to make fun of Jonathan McIntosh and then found out about this whole shooting thing and got sidetracked. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm going to go back to making fun of Jonathan McIntosh. As irritating as he is, he doesn't shoot people. So, he no. frustrates me just a little bit less than extremists shooting people. Yeah, there's just been so much of that. You know, the, the I, I guess we're on the subject, so we may as well keep going for a little bit. Um, the Planned Parenthood stuff that's yeah. been going on. Yeah, it's like shocking. Another, another ideologically motivated bearded nut job from, you know, third world settings that doesn't have an indoor plumbing yeah. goes on a shooting spree. Like, I'm noting a pattern that, that that kind of living condition and belief system combined. I'm just saying that apparently just, just anyone with a beard just <laughs> be weary. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because he was a total nutball. If you go read his stuff, he's really fun to to get into because he's completely insane. Wooden, like, stick crosses attached to fences and some Blair Witch stuff going on there. Well, you know, unfortunately this year it's been, um, you know, I mean, it, it, I don't know what the, since, since then, but a couple months ago it was, what, 0.87 days between a mass shooting, which yeah. is four people or more. And I don't know if that if that pattern has continued, but it, it essentially has, and yeah. it, it also comes from a redefinition issue, yeah, which where we didn't used to call things mass shootings that we now are. Well, do you think that they happened more in the past, or is this no, there's, or no, is it increasing? Been a, it's been a steady uptick. Yeah, it hasn't been like everyone's like you, when you discuss it with people, they're like 2015 has been. You're like no, 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 no. Go back to 1991 and yeah. start watching this slowly tick up. Mm-hmm. It's not 2015, all of a sudden, what happened? Guys, this has been going on for, like, 20 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know why anyone's shocked, honestly. It's not surprising that these are continuing. As the population increases, obviously these kind of incidences are going to increase. Well, there's, there's a stressor there. Yeah, in a society that doesn't shift any of its other concepts. Yeah. But... I, I just find that um, that there's been a concerted effort to recruit these kinds of people and train them to believe in a certain way so that they will support ideas that are against their own best interests. Of course. So, you know, I and mean... Religion's a good place to start because it teaches you your self-interest is evil. No. So I, I haven't thought about that. That's, that's always a really easy jump-off yeah. point when you can say, hey, everything you think is good is evil, and if you follow this path, it'll teach you the true way of being happy and, and fulfilling lifestyle. Okay. 
and you just oh well then all that stuff is evil uh, it's a great easy starting point when you are yourself evil like the concept of original sin what else is it well yeah i i, un I understand that um that you start off you know that you start off broken and you have to you are commanded to fix yourself as, mm -hmm. it, as it were but yeah this concept of um yeah I'll have, to, I'll have to think about that a little bit more. I, I, I really hadn't quite meshed those ideas. Yeah, just psychologically speaking, the first step is to tell someone they're useless. It's the same technique the army yeah. uses. Uh -huh. It's very efficient psychologically when it comes to human beings, and it's the same reason I, I have a problem with a lot of the call-out culture and stuff like that. Is you're, you're talking about damaging people and spreading a whole culture of fear. It's, it's unusual. It has a very The, the call-out culture? Yeah. Yeah, we may need to save this for another episode that may even have to go on the other show. <laughs> that, that that was a random drop that doesn't really affect atheism. Yeah. So. Except when it does, and they call famous atheists, uh, you know, women-hating people and things like that, racist. Mm -hmm. Stephen, uh, or is it um, Richard Dawkins is a white supremacist now, by the way. Just oh. Go ahead and wrap your head around all that. <laughs> yeah. That's the culture we live in. Why? Because he's a white man who's famous and says things about Muslims. Full stop. That's all it takes. Yep. You agree? Yeah. I don't know. That that sort of silences me with two minutes left. Yeah. Yeah. Dead air, dead air. Maybe we should maybe we should have a moment of silence to think about uh, Richard Dawkins. Yeah. I mean, one of the most polite people you've ever met. Hitchens, I would have been like, yeah, okay, he's kind of a <laughs> kind of difficult person. But uh, Dawkins? No. He doesn't even raise his voice. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, that's uh, that's what we're dealing with, and 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 on the left, that's the left attacking the left. So I don't understand what the end result of that is going to be, aside from fracturing. Yeah. Why would you Why would you take a hammer and fracture your own ideologies? I don't. Does it stand stronger that way, people? Is that Has that ever been the case? I don't think so. I've never observed that. Well, you know, this is this is the age of the personal. It's yep. the age of my feelings, yep. and um, you know, I look yeah, at I look. At, yeah, so we got we got a minute left. So I guess I get to rant for a minute by myself. You get to tap dance. <laughs> so, yeah, this all started out. Uh, I guess I guess I may as well talk about my next thing that I'm reading, which is the Bible Unearthed, uh, which actually has a copyright date of um, 2000. But this is a group, um, Israel Finkelstein and Neil Asher Silberman, two good Jewish names, okay, who were among many archaeologists who went digging in the Middle East when Israel invited them in. And uh, the game was to, quote, find the title deeds to the kingdom, unquote. Um, and so after digging for a long time, they said, well, you know, maybe all that stuff in the Bible really doesn't quite pass the truth test. And so, interesting book. See you next time. Bye-bye.